Good evening, everyone. My name is Kevin Glowacki, and I am the director of the Center for Heritage Conservation at Texas A&M University. It is my pleasure to welcome you all to our presentation tonight. Although we can't gather in person yet, at least we have all learned to come together on Zoom to learn new things and to share our passion for history and heritage in this virtual environment. Our speaker this evening is Dr. Anant Geva, Professor Emerita of Architecture at Texas A&M University, where she taught design, preservation, the history of building technology and sacred architecture. She holds a Bachelor of Science in Architecture and City Planning from the Israel Institute of Technology, a Master of Architecture from The Ohio State University, and a PhD in Architecture from Texas A&M University. In addition to her academic career, Dr. Geva is a registered architect in Israel. Dr. Geva has a long history of distinguished service to numerous professional organizations. For example, she has been a board member for the Association for Preservation Technology, the Architecture, Culture, and Spirituality Forum, and the Society of Architectural Historians. She has also served as president of the Southeast chapter of the Society of Architectural Historians, as vice chair of the Construction History Society of America, and as secretary of the National Council for Preservation Education. She has been co-editor of ARIS, which is the journal of the Southeast chapter of the Society of Architectural Historians, and a founding co-editor of Preservation Education and Research, the journal of the National Council for Preservation Education. Dr. Gave's book, Frank Lloyd Wright's Sacred Architecture, Faith, Form, and Building Technology, was published by Rutledge in 2012. More recently, she has edited a volume on modernism and American mid 20th century sacred architecture, and with Inbal Ben Asher Gittler, co edited the volume Israel as a Modern Architectural Experimental Lab, 1948 to 1978. Her forthcoming book on modern American synagogues is under contract with Texas A&M University Press, and we look forward to learning about some of the research for that book in her presentation tonight. I'd also like to point out, especially for our graduate students in the audience, that Dr. Geva was one of the first two students to earn the Interdisciplinary Graduate Certificate in Historic Preservation at Texas A&M. Later, as a faculty member, Dr. Geva has served as a faculty fellow of the Center for Heritage Conservation since its foundation as a formal research center in 2005. For these reasons and more, it is my great pleasure to introduce Anat Geva as the first speaker in our new lecture series, Heritage Matters Talks. Dr. Geva. Thank you, Kevin, for inviting me to open the Center of Heritage Conservation lecture series entitled Heritage Matters Talks. And thank you all for attending this presentation via Zoom. This lecture is based on one of the chapters in my forthcoming book entitled Pushing the Envelope, Modern American Synagogues from 1950s to 1960s, which will be published by Texas A&M University Press. The study of preservation of the recent past unfolds into two aspects. First, making people aware, aware of modernism as a unique style in the history of architecture in, the, in America and in the world. This awareness promotes the preservation of modernism as a cultural and saving those buildings from 1950s to 1970s. The second level uh, of preservation of the recent past is the practical aspect of what, why, and how to preserve these buildings. The first part of advocating preservation of recent past involved changing some popular perceptions Argument try to make the case that these are not historic buildings because after all, they are part of our lifetime. However, in America, we can consider a historic building or site if they are 50 years old. The other popular perception is that these modern buildings, especially the concrete monuments such as Boston City Hall from 1968 or Paul Rudolph's Orange County Government Center from 1967 that was demolished in 2015 seem ugly and not worth saving. Here we can argue that ugliness is in the eye of the beholder. 
and we preserve various styles because they present an era, its heritage and culture, and even architectural engineering innovations. Recent publications on preserving the recent past, buildings from 1950s to 1970s, focus mainly on preservation measures concerning materials directly associated with modernism innovations such as concrete, uh, steel, and glass. Scholars and practitioners claim that the experimental materials of that period were integral in the creation of the modernist statement. Some even look at concrete as a cultural phenomenon and as it is the material that serves as an image of a progressive modern medium. Indeed, modernism is characterized by experiments in building technology such as materials and systems that influence the building's shape. Therefore, scholars who address the conservation of modern heritage highlight the importance and, challenging of, and challenges of preserving the building's material that were central to that time. Still, they are debate they are debating on the authenticity issues of the historic integrity of modern buildings. Some, like Theodore Prudhon, claim, and I quote, authenticity relies on the continuity of the original design intent more often than on preservation of original materials, end of quote. However, when the original materials is, is in the, sorry, the original design is driven by the use of new materials, as in the case of modern architecture, the preservation effort of material authenticity remains dominant in keeping the integrity of the original design. There is a general agreement among preservationists that the preservation approach of the recent parts places important on the design and technology as a continuation of the original intent. Thus, it focuses on the original materials and system as they became synonymous with preserving modernism and its culture. Following this focus, guidelines were developed and workshops and symposia were organized to help those preserving preservation initiatives. Some prominent examples are Docomomo International and Docomomo USA. ECOMOS 12th Century Heritage International Scientific Com Committee, Madrid and New Delhi document, the Getty Conservation Institute Conserva Conserving Modern uh, Arch Architectural in in Initiative, and the Association for Preservation Technology International, APT Technical Committee on Modern Heritage. Examining the security of the interior standard for the treatment of historic properties, which we call the 10 points of the security of the interior standard show that they are all geared uh, toward materials preservation. My research on mid 20th century modern American sacred architecture reveals that most congregation across the US feeling, feel obligated to preserve their houses of worship for future generation. They proudly maintain and preserve these institutions with an attempt to save the buildings modernism. Their ongoing work on these mid 20th century structures became part of the preservation of the recent past buildings. However, this congregation faced other challenges beyond brick and mortar that were not less talked about or published. This includes demographic changes, changes in liturgy, new building code, and the need for new energy conservation strategies. The different facets of these cha changes called for the administrative and religious adaptations, which were directly reflected in various architectural modifications. The changes were triggered by the decline in attendance of services due to aging members. They also relate to the decline in membership due to younger generations waning affiliation with religion. Some changes were influenced by the move of members out of their synagogues neighborhood to establish congregation in newer suburbs around the city or other cities. Congregation became very creative in solving these challenges while maintaining the integrity of their original houses of worship. Solution included interior modifications such as construction of new smaller chapels, shifting the focus of the house of worship to education, to attract 
young families, and providing options of an adaptive use. The results of those architectural solutions also help the buildings to comply with newer building codes, such as the American with Disability Act, ADA, to lower their energy bills and to cater to some liturgical changes, which focus on creating a closer relationship between the congregation and their officials. In my forthcoming book, as the, in the presentation, I focus on modern American synagogues built between 1950s and 1960s that still serve as synagogues and were designed by prominent modernist architects in various American suburbs. The decline of membership associated with aging members translated to practical issues of accessibility. Most of the original designs of modern American synagogues do not cater to elderly or disabled members. At the time of the synagogue's design and construction, most of the original congregations were comprised of young people who had recently moved to the suburbs to start new lives and to fulfill the American dream. In addition, the building code at the time did not include ADA, which was initiated only in 1990. As the original members aged, accommodations were necessary to enable them to enter the buildings and participate in regular and special services. In the case of Eric Mendelssohn Park Synagogue in Cleveland, Ohio, from 1953, the original main entrance is raised by several stairs. To provide an access to all, a common and popular additions of a ramp and handrail were utilized. As you can see in this slide, this case does not seem as a sensitive solution to the original design. A different approach to access that, that seems like a more respectful design can be found in the case of Frank Lloyd Wright's Beth Shalom Synagogue in Elkin Park, Pennsylvania from 1956. In 2011, the firm of John Milner Architects from Chadford, Pennsylvania, left the main entrance as is, adding a small ramp to an existing side entrance and replaced the outdoor stairs with a drop-off area for better accessibility. Moreover, they also designed an elevator at that side entrance. This elevator serves the sanctuary level and the lower level of the sisterhood chapel and accessible restrooms. This sensitive addition was seen by the architect, and I quote, as challenging both from the standpoint of preservation and technical feasibility, end of quote. The elevator was constructed in a, the east area of the sanctuary in order to minimize intervention to the original building and to provide accessibility to both sanctuaries. The only changes that resulted from the installation of the in eleva elevator in the rear spine of the building were as follows. The dismantling of the rabbi's study, the replacement of one of the back stairs behind the sisterhood chapel with a ramp, the modification of the South Oregon chamber, and the enlargement of an existing interior door in the main sanctuary to enter from the elevator, which as you can see on the right side of the slide, visually had minimal impact when viewed from the seating area. Another solution to accessibility issue includes additions of new entrances from the parking lot. Though the standard handrails were added to the original main entrance of Temple of Herb Shalom in Baltimore, Levin Brown Architects from Owen Mills, Maryland provided a new entrance on the side of the building as part of their 1987 renovations of the temple that was originally designed by Walter Gropius and Sheldon Levitt in 1960. The entrance was designed as part of their addition of a new chapel to the original structure on the side of the building. The addition of the new chapel and the entrance attempted to respect the original monumental main elevation with four decorative arches that reflect the original structural arch. Additional aspect to improve Accessibility was to make the bima, the sanctuary stage from where the Torah is read, reachable to all. One important part in Jewish services 
is the invitation of a worshiper to stand on the bima and read parts of the Torah. This is an extreme honor for the member of the congregation and his or her family. In most Orthodox synagogues, the leader of the service is seen as an emissary of the community, in Hebrew, shaliach tibur, rather than a clergyman in position of special, special, special authority. As such, the bima, usually centrally located as part of the worshiper's space, facing the ark that is located toward the direction of Jerusalem. This arrangement can be found in both synagogues on the Ashkenazi Jews, those of European descent, and of the Sephardi Jews, those of Spain and Islamic countries descent. In contrast, conser conservative and reform sanctuaries were designed with a theater seating arrangement where the bima acts as a high stage detached from the audience. A higher level bima arrangement reflected a hierarchical design of the sanctuary, which separates between officiant and the cong 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 congregation and introduces a sense of a greater decorum in worship services. However, a high bima makes it difficult for elderly and disabled member to participate in the service when called to step on the bima. The raised bima of North Shore Congregation Synagogue in Glencoe, Illinois, designed by architect Minoru Yamasaki in 1964, can be reached by stairs with handrail or by a side ramp that Yamasaki designed as an integral part of the original sanctuary. Yet, Rarely can we find such examples from that period. Most of the change, changes in accessing the bima occurs much later. I'm going to show you two dramatic examples of such modifications. First example includes the 2005 renovations of Knesset Tiferet Israel Synagogue in Port Chester, New York, designed by Philip Johnson in 1956. Johnson designed the bima following the liturgical requirements at that time. The expectation called for a hierarchical arrangement in which the rabbi and the clergy are on the upper stage above the congregation. Johnson raised the bima by six stairs placed on the side. He designed the ark as a wooden cabinet and collaborated with artist Ibram Lasso who designed the internal light, the menorah, and the background of the bima. Following Laszlo's death in 2003 and Johnson's in 2005, the congregation sold the artwork of the sanctuary to the Jewish Museum in New York City. They only left the menorah to stand in the sanctuary and replaced the bima and its elements. This dramatic act that raises some questions is a different and interesting topic that you'll be able to read in details in the book or in my paper online entitled, An Architect Asks for Forgiveness. Back to the and liturgical changes at, as related to the Bima of this synagogue. In 2005, architect Michael Berkowitz from Presentations Gallery firm in Mount Vernon, New York, replaced Johnson's original Bima with a lower Bima and added a side ramp. This solution not only catered to the ADA accessibility requirement, but also exhibits the changes in liturgy from a hierarchical arrangement doctrine to a layout that enhances closer relationship between congregants and their officials. As you can see, the changes also includes a new arc, a new eternal light, new chairs, and new background. The traditional conservative design that used symbolically Jerusalem stone completely contrasts the original modernist design of Johnson and Lasso. In order to preserve the modern sanctuary, the modifications focused only on the area of the bima and left the sanctuary in its original design that some scholars call a jewel box. An additional example of creating new accessible bima is in the 2001 modified bima of Temple Oheb Shalom Synagogue in Baltimore. 
The original BIMA was designed by architect Walter Gropius and Sheldon Levitt in 1960 as an elevated pedestal above the sloped up seating area of the sanctuary. The architect believed that this arrangement enhanced the feeling of ascent and glorified the ark and the officiant who served the congregation. The wooden ark of 20 feet in the, in the shape of the tablets of the Ten Commandments was designed by artist Georgi Kipis and Robert Persur. Almost 40 years later, Levine Brown architects renovated and reconfigured the sanctuary by reversing the location of the bima to the rear side of the original sanctuary facing northwest and designing a new niche from stone and to host a new metal and glass arc for which they won the 2003 honor or award by the AIA Interface Forum of Religion, Art and Architecture and by Faith and Form magazine. They left the original BIMA to serve as a balcony for additional seating in the back. The change in orientation from the traditional direction toward Jerusalem was justified already by architect Eric Mendelssohn who claimed that God is all around us and therefore it does not matter where the BIMA and ARC are located. Architects Levine and Brown also reversed the seating to slope down toward the new bima, which is lower and smaller in size and scale. This change provided accessibility to the bima, fulfills the ADA requirement, generates more intimate worship experience, and complies with the liturgical changes in conservative and reformed synagogues where there is an attempt to bring officials and congregations closer together both spatially and psychologically. In addition, the new seating arrangement allows the worshiper to view and enjoy the original stained glass windows designed by Kipis in 1960. In the original design, the con congregates sat with their backs to these three windows. In my visit to the synagogue, I talked to the rabbi and members of the co building committee about these drastic modifications. The conversation revealed the gap between generations uh, of the congregation. The older members wanted to preserve the sanctuary in its original design and to continue the traditional ways of service. They voted against the new renovation, though the modification catered to their needs. The younger members see the new worship space and the various additions as an evolution while attempting to preserve the integrity of the original modern design. They also hope that the modified sanctuary and the changes in liturgical conduct of the services may attract new young families. These attempts bring us to an additional solution to overcome the decline in synagogue's membership due to fewer new members. In order to attract new members, especially young families, many congregations focused refocus their attention to education with retrofitting existing classroom and adding new ones while preserving the original integrity of the synagogue complex. In 2003, Minoru Yamasaki Associate added a new floor to the Yamasaki's 1964 School of North Shore Congregation Israel in Glencoe, Illinois. The firm utilized the site topography to add a new floor below the original existing classrooms. This elegant solution used the original paved courtyard between the sanctuary and the school as a balcony and left the playground at the entrance level. The lower level facade includes glass walls to bring daylight into the classrooms. Internal stairs, were added at the end of the left corridor of the synagogue and serve as the entrance to the additional classrooms below. The school can be reached by the original entrance from the parking lot and by a new addition uh, of glass entrance from the courtyard. The sensitive addition maintained the modern integrity of the original design and became an in integrated part of the complex. It is plausible to assume that when the original architectural firm designs new additions, the architects are more attuned to the, their existing modern 
recent past buildings. Declines in new membership also became an issue of maintaining the huge monumental sanctuary for daily and Shabbat services. With the rise of energy costs, congregation looked into energy conservation solutions in, case, in cases where small chapels were not included as part of the original design, congregations added new chapels to accommodate smaller groups of worshipers while leaving the large original sanctuary mainly for high attendance services of high holidays, festivals, and family celebrations like wedding and bar mitzvahs. Before showing you examples of these additions, here are some examples of smaller chapels that were designed as part of the original modern synagogues. Eric Mendelssohn designed a chapel at the edge of the main sanctuary in his park synagogue with similar motifs as we can find in the main sanctuary. Frank Lloyd Wright designed the sisterhood chapel below the main sanctuary. Again, he used the same motifs of the main sanctuary, including a similar design of furniture. Los Angeles-based modern architect Sidney Eisenstadt designed Temple Sinai Synagogue in El Paso, Texas in 1964 with a separate chapel building as part of the whole complex, but detached from the main building. Eisenstadt's design approach to, to the chapel was different from Mendelssohn and Wright. He designed a building with a distinct exterior and interior different from the main sanctuary. Though both the main sanctuary and the chapel were designed to provide shelter from the harsh desert environment of the region, the chapel creates a symbol of a tent, the tabernacle, while the main sanctuary more of a cave. While in the sanctuary, Eisenstadt collaborated with artist Wilt Harrison to design the ark, in the chapel, similar to Mendelssohn and Wright, that he designed all the details and the core. Other architects such as Walter Gropius and Minoru Yamasaki did not include a smaller chapel in their overall design. As mentioned before, congregation added new chapels to accommodate smaller numbers of cong cong congregates attending services and helped lower the rise, rising utility bill. The addition of the Perlman Sanctuary, a new chapel for the North Short Congregation Israel in Glencoe, Illinois, is an example of how a new chapel enables the congregation to gather for daily and Shabbat services without opening the original large monumental sanctuary. The new chapel was designed by Chicago architects Hammond, Bibi, and Babka in 1979. The congregation selected them following several interviews with local architects and after the office of Minori Yamasaki Associate who designed the original synagogue withdrew their name uh, from consideration due to other commitments. The chapel was built as a cylindrical building at the edge of the original south wing of the synagogue. The circular prayer space was embedded into a large rectangular social hall addition. Though the exterior of the chapel is round, in contrast to the line used by Yamasaki, the architects attempted to respect the wishes of the congregation by using the same bricks of the south wing and integrating the new with the old on the outside. However, the chapel's entrance from outside was designed in a postmodern style with contrast with the original modern glass entrances to the synagogues and its wings. It should be noted that in 2003, Minoru Yamasaki Associates proposed a change to the chapel's exterior entrance that would better in integrate the chapel's exterior with the original synagogue's complex but it was not materialized. In 1979, the chapel interior was designed in a post-modernist style that completely contrasts the modernist style of the original sanctuary from 1964. As a post-modernist architect, Thomas Bibi looked for inspiration to the great classic styles of European synagogues. Specifically, he was inspired by the rich traditional sporadic synagogues of Venice. Indeed, when I visited the chapel, I felt as if I returned 100 years of years 
back in history to a traditional historic European synagogue with eclectic details drawn from various styles. It was hard to understand the extreme difference in styles between Yamasaki's original sanctuary that took my breath away and the chapel that felt out of place. Author Samuel Gruber claimed that just as the congregation willingly embraced modernism for their first sanctuary in 1964, they chose to build the chapel in the newest postmodernist style of the late 1970s. The congregation rabbi, Herbert Bronstein, expressed the wish of the congregation to feel a sense of sanctity that he claimed was lost in the large monumental original sanctuary, and therefore he welcomed the new chapel. The architect believed that by selecting a different architectural style, such as postmodernism, their design do not complete, does not complete with the original modern building. This approach is seen in preservation project in which the style of a new addition contrasts the original in order to highlight the existing building. Since architect Bibi did not regard Yamasaki's synagogue as a masterpiece, it has hard to tell, it is hard to tell if this approach was his design intent. Congregation also face acoustical challenges due to hearing impairing, impaired aging congregates. In addition, younger members also ex expect the prayers and music to be livelier and reverberate within the volume of the sanctuary. Though some modern architects treat acoustics as part of their original synagogue design, their solution had to be revisited and often synagogues under, uh, and often the synagogue under performing audio system had to be upgraded or replaced. In, or, in other case, an audio system had to be added and today most if not all of the recent past synagogues include these systems. The challenges of installing new speakers, microphones and control panel are both functional and aesthetics. The study of the practical audio concerns in synagogues unfold into two issues. One relates to the general acoustical problems of houses of worship, where the solution have to cater to varied sounds like preaching, praying, singing, music. The second concern relates specifically to synagogues and their flexible designs. Social halls were designed adjacent to the sanctuaries with partitions or the or divider to be open during high holidays and special festivities. The enlarged area and increased capacity of worshipers call for a multi-output audio system in order to accommodate the various activities. This can be seen in Percival Goodman's solution in Congregation Sharay Tzedek, Southfield, Michigan, a suburb of uh, Detroit, designed in 1962. There, the sanctuary as well as the adjacent social halls are served by the audio system and acoustic measures for noise reduction, such as gold bone acoustic ceiling tiles that facilitate various activities in each of the spaces at the same time. The aesthetic aspect of installing a new audio system in the sanctuary should be sensitive to the original architectural design. An example of this consideration is the 2006 replacement of the old audio system with a new upgraded system in Pietro Bolucci's Temple Ne Yeshurun in Short Hill, New Jersey of 1964. The new speakers on the bima attempt to match the, wo the wood finishes of the organ pipe, as the speakers located underneath the balconies attempt to match the wood floor uh, finishes of the gallery. Speakers were also installed inside the structure to provide acoustical coverage for all seats in the sanctuary. Microphones are positioned on the two lectures and on the left side balcony above the organ player. Though the replacement, the replacement in the sanctuary is necessary for audio coverage for the diverse uses of the synagogues, they are visible and not exactly an elegant solution. The final issue I would like to present in this lecture is the question of adaptive use of spaces that are not used anymore due to the decline of membership 
and the decrease in numbers of students attending the synagogue school. Idea of reusing part of the building for new purposes other than their original functions emerge as means to save and preserve the synagogue, mainly its sanctuary. This is the case of Temple Mount Sinai in El Paso, Texas from 1964. In 2014, the congregation commissioned local firm in situ architecture to assess the facility conditions and propose solution to preserve and save the, the synagogue. Institute architectural reports included a comprehensive assessment and analysis of the existing physical and spiritual conditions of the synagogue's complex and site. Following this assessment, the architect recommended extensive maintenance work, which included rehabilitation project to deal with hazardous materials such as asbestos, address accessibility and ADA issues, and upgrade the parking and landscape. The second part of the reports include, included plans to save the building through adaptive reuse of the education wing on the lower level, the green in the drawing. that was hardly used at the time of the analysis, and to utilize the large site of the synagogue, the green area. Two alternatives were suggested to adapt, for adapted reuse of the educational wing of the temple, green in the drawing. The first option called for conversion of the existing school to a charter school, while keeping religious, a small religious school at the entrance level green in the drawing. The plan does not require major adaptation to the lower floor, though it necessitates interior changes on the entrance floor. The administration offices would become classrooms for a small religious school of the synagogue's members, the green. These offices would take place of the existing multiple use room, kitchen, and part of the social hall, the purple. This proposed proposal maintain, maintains the historic integrity of the synagogue complex and especially of its originally sanctuary, the orange and the chapel in purple. Thus, Temple Mount Sinai can continue to serve the religious needs of the Jewish community. The second option was a proposal for adaptive use of the school. This option is turning the school into an assistant living facility for elderly Jewish community members. This proposal entails changes to the entrance floor as mentioned before. It also implies major modification to the lower floor, converting classrooms into studio apartment spaces. However, it still maintains the historic integrity of the synagogue as a complex and specifically of the praying wing, the chapel in orange, and the chap, the, sorry, the sanctuary in orange, and the chapel in purple. This proposal includes accessibility solution that would make it easy for the elderly to stay within the synagogue's complex and use the sanctuary and chapel for prayer and studying. It also may encourage their families to join them for Shabbat and high holiday service and to celebrate their family festivities in the building. This proposal was an appealing solution since it has the potential of generate more revenues for the synagogue. In addition, Institute Architect suggested you to utilize the large site of the synagogue to build a new neighborhood on the far side of the lot. The housing development will include 29 living units, which will create revenue for the synagogue and hopefully will attract new members to join the community. This initiative would maintain the synagogue building's historic integrity, but would change the suburban feel to a more urban environment. This change may hurt some of the historic integrity of the site, especially its sustainable landscape design. Still, I believe that if the planned neighborhood follows the original sustainable design of the synagogue and its landscape, it can blend as part of the synagogue surrounding. As for the time of this presentation, the congregation leases the school at the lower level to a Jewish preschool while looking into rehabilitation project based on in-situ assessment 
reports. They plan to replace the whole HVAC system and work on finished materials, insulation, water prevention improvement, and some issues of accessibility. With that, congregation commit to preserve this, this synagogue and continue, continue their goods to worship. Preserving the recent past modern American synagogues means the protection of historic synagogues that belong to an important inventory of American modern architecture of 1950s and 1960s. Furthermore, it preserved the unique contribution of each of those buildings and highlights the context of modern American architecture in the mid 20th century. Thank you.